My name is Brock, and this is the Dungeon Master's Toolkit Podcast. On today's episode, I talked to Cade from Sweden. We talked about writing one-shots, planning and running games for people with neurodivergence. We also talked a little bit about writing games, system variety, doing NPC voices, and having players take notes at the table. It was a really fun conversation, and I hope you enjoy. Remember that we do have a design contest taking place right now. We are taking submissions from now until July 23rd, which will be two weeks from now. And the winner will be announced on the episode of July 30th. There is a submission form in the description. And you can also head over to the Discord server if you want to chat about it or just get a little bit more information. Everybody is welcome to participate. Uh, and the reward is a $10 gift card to either Amazon or DriveThruRPG. I will be reading one of the submissions in the middle of this episode so you guys can get some inspiration. I will also leave a timestamp in the description of the YouTube video so that people can jump to that section if they would like to hear that. And finally, if you would like to support the show, there's a few ways that you can do that. First off, interacting, liking, and sharing the episodes with other Dungeon Masters or players that you think might be interested. That's always a good way to grow the community. The second way you can support the channel is to join our Discord server so you can be a part of the community, join the conversation, participate in polls and just various things, find games on the server. Being on the Discord is also one of the easiest ways to get in for an interview because I often post interview slots on there that people can sign up for. So if you're looking at getting interviewed, I highly recommend you join the Discord server. And if you're interested in supporting the show financially, consider treating yourself to a new RPG book or product through any of the affiliate links in the show descriptions. And I'm going to tell you a little secret in that the affiliate links work for any product you buy, not just the ones that are linked. So if you have a book that you've been eyeing for a while and you want to pick it up, but you also want to support the show, just click on one of my affiliate links and then go find your cart and check out and I'll still get slight credit for the sale. That's just a really good way to support creators, but also get something for yourself. And without further ado, let's get into the episode. Today I have Kate with me. Welcome, Kate. Hello. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in tabletop role-playing games? Well, uh, I am a lifelong nerd, and I have been around the kind of people who play Dungeons and Dragons for several years at this point. I have myself only been playing for Slightly less than two years now, actually, after finally managing to join a group that was starting up a new campaign uh, at a time when I happened to be available. After that, it took me about half a year to start DMing myself, uh, mostly one shots in between other campaigns. I've been in the apparently rather unusual position of uh, knowing a lot of other DMs. So. My role-playing group is mostly just bouncing between the same core group of people with different people DMing different campaigns all at the same time. So I've been squeezing out my own experience with DMing in between that and leveraging the fact that I've been uh, a hobbyist uh, writer since my early teens in order to write a lot of my own one-shots and story material for role-playing. And just as soon as I get a word in edgeways with my role-playing group, I do hope to get to actually run a longer campaign myself because I have many ideas. But for the time being, I am stepping in where the regular DMs need a break and running quick little one-shot adventures to give them a week off. Hey, that can be super handy just to get people a chance to, to breathe a little bit. How many campaigns do you guys have actively running at one time? Oh, uh, 
Right now, there's uh, three that are active and two that are sort of on the back burner, longer gaps between sessions. Um, and then, so do you just kind of like cycle between which campaign you're playing each week then? Um, it's more a case of one of them is more or less on a weekly schedule. One of them is fortnightly. And then another one is also mostly once a week, but a bit more variable because of the work schedule of the DM who has that particular campaign. Mm, sure. Uh, it's uh, We've actually been cramming in a lot more role playing than we would otherwise be doing because of uh, the viral apocalypse that has been raging since the start <laughs> of last year. Uh, <laughs> So none of us have anything else to do. <laughs> I mean, what better way to spend your your nights, right? Yeah, so what? much Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and are you are you playing? Um, or what system are you playing? D and D then? Most of what we're playing is Dungeons and Dragons. Although we will usually shake it up with the one shots a bit more. So I'm a big fan of running stuff in uh, the Coriolis system. I have a friend who's uh, very fond of the Troika system and. Those one shots are almost starting to be a campaign in their own right, uh, to the extent that Troika works for campaigns. But most of the proper campaigns, so to speak, are Dungeons and Dragons 5e. Uh, what was that first system? I don't know that I'm familiar with that one. Uh, Coriolis. Uh, that is a system by Free League Publishing, uh, originally in uh, Swedish, which uh, I completely skipped over that introducing myself, but uh, I am in fact Swedish and I live in Sweden and play role-playing games with Swedish people. So Coriolis is uh, originally Swedish language. I believe it is also available in English, but uh, I haven't checked. And that is a sort of space opera, sort of fantasy sci-fi, cosmic horror setting with heavy focus on exploration and mystery. Uh, hmm. How to explain? A very big part of the setting there is that space is big and scary and there are a lot of things in it which want to kill you. Sure. <laughs> and the players are just the crew of a small spaceship trying to survive in that setting. And uh, it, it suits the way that I that I like to write my one shots quite well. So I'm I'm quite fond of it myself. So on that note, maybe let's talk a little bit about how you do write your one shots. Oh yeah, one shots can be difficult because you're working within such a contained amount of time, and that's something that I've run into trouble with because coming from the background of being a hobbyist writer. I tend to get very wordy when I write, so it's really been an exercise in just trimming away everything that's unnecessary when I write one-shots. So the way I usually approach one-shots is I know that I can push the people I play with for four or five hours at the most, and generally I want to try and plan for slightly less than that, uh, just in case they decide to take ages doing something that I thought was going to take them five minutes. So. Usually there's an opening, a sort of action, and then a closing segment when I write. And I'm usually expecting that to be maybe four or five distinct scenes in total. And I, I'm i not a very combat heavy uh, GM, so there's usually maybe one bigger combat encounter, maybe one or two smaller, depending on the one shot within that structure. But essentially, the parts that I always try to have clear in my head before I go into running a one-shot is how do the adventurers get introduced to what they're doing? Then the thing they're doing, obviously. Presumably there's some encounter that is sort of the plot of the one-shot. And then I always try and make sure I have a clear wrap-up where the situation is resolved even if all their questions aren't necessarily answered, because I do write a lot of mystery style one shots. So really breaking everything down to those basic free acts and not adding too much detail is often the trick with one shots. It doesn't need to be more complicated than this is your opening scene. This is what your players are doing. This is how the situation resolves. 
it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. And if you make it more complicated than that, it is going to get too long. Right. You're just going to run out of time and the players are going to fill a lot of that, a lot of the details in for you anyways, when they're playing. Oh yeah. I mean, I've had a one shot where my players basically went at the plot I had uh, written out for them completely backwards. Uh, <laughs> I learned a lot from that session. I mean, it, it went fine and they all enjoyed it, but uh, oh boy, <laughs> only uh, 10 minutes in and most of my planning was out the window. <laughs> what? So you, you kind of do broad strokes for like the beginning and the end. Um, do you do much for other planning as far as the session goes? Or is it just just pretty loose and then lots of improv? So most of the middle section tends to be quite loose, especially since that one session where they did the plot backwards. I do like to have notes on important locations, NPCs who have important information. And if there's going to be combat encounters, I do try to have the stat blocks lined up before I start, especially if I'm running something in 5e. Uh, the systems that I work with a lot more, Coriolis, for instance, is a lot simpler than Dungeons and Dragons in terms of what the stat blocks for your opponents look like. Sure. So those I can make up off the top of my head in a different way and also make up without doing anything too horrible to the way that the combat system is balanced. 5e, I don't really have that sense for, so I need to have those stat blocks prepared in advance in a different way or I'm going to run into trouble. Within that frame, though, I mean, my planning document for one shots is basically I'll have a block of uh, text that describes the setup and then a very rough idea of what they're doing in the middle and then the resolution and then everything else is just a list of NPCs and locations and the exact order in which they deal with all of those isn't necessarily super important. That's one thing I've learned from, uh, well, partly that one session <laughs> <laughs> and also just reading up on GMing in general is that it can be more helpful to think of what do I need the players to know or have done before they move on to the next part of the story rather than what they should be doing to get there. Right. They just need to, you just need to have the pieces of information that move the story along, but let them figure out how they get those or. Yes, exactly. It doesn't really matter in terms of what they're going to find when they get to the center of the temple or whatever. It doesn't really matter in terms of what the treasure is, which NPC they get the information from, so to speak. So if they go to talk to NPC A or B, they're going to get slightly different interactions because I've prepared two different NPCs. They might get slightly different information that will lead them to different solutions to the problem of getting into the temple. This is a this is a one shot I haven't actually run, so I'm going to have to be careful about uh, <laughs> telling my my friends to check this podcast out. But uh, hopefully that that's not too many spoilers. They're going to get slightly different experiences because I have planned different NPCs for those different paths, so to speak. But they'll get to the end of the session either way. They're still going to get the thing in the temple. And that's really the core is that they can wobble off the path in the middle of the one shot and they frequently will. I just need to know as a GM how to bring them to more or less the same ending point and make sure that I close it off before they're all too sleepy to talk straight. <laughs> so do you use some of that planning to kind of kind of guide the players back to, like if they kind of wander too far off of your plot, do you kind of try to corral them and, and push them back in the right direction? A little bit, yes. It's uh, it's difficult to run a one shot without being at least a little bit railroady. Uh, and DMing, as I often do for a bunch of other DMs, I sort of I don't expect to not have them notice that I'm railroading them. <laughs> That's just something that I, I mean. It's something that the other people in my play group have also struggled with. They don't always enjoy having their plot twists guessed because everyone else at the table also is a GM and knows how these things work. But it's something that we just have to make peace with. The other people around the table know what it looks like behind the screen and they're going to know what we're doing. But at the same time, everyone is very accepting of that. So 
I don't generally get in trouble for railroading my players a tiny bit. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say they, they've all seen behind the curtain, so yeah, they kind of know what's happening. I know when we played our, we had a one shot, a Blades in the Dark one shot a couple weeks ago, and I, I had never played with all uh, GMs before. It was always just like me as the dungeon master or one other person as the dungeon master. And it was a much different experience because everybody was like, well, we want to do this for the story, but like we don't want to step on anybody's toes. So it was a lot more like relaxed versus like if you're playing with people who are only players, then the, I, don't, I don't even know how to say it. There's just a, It's just a different interaction um, when you have only players or people who are also dungeon masters. It evens out the power dynamic a bit, I think. You end up in a position of having to take on a lot more responsibility when you are the only GM at the table and thus the one who is expected to have all of the knowledge about the system and understand everything in a very different way. Meanwhile, even when I'm not playing in this group of mostly GMs, people are very comfortable just looking to me, the resident rules gremlin, and saying, so how does this thing work? Because I cannot remember which rule book it's in. And that just so happens to be a thing I'm good at remembering. So it becomes this sort of co-GMing thing, even when I'm technically a player. And that's, it can take the load off the, the person who's actually GMing. Uh, they don't always appreciate having to look through the rules while they're trying to run a scene with a different player character. Yeah, that's... And that sort of dynamic can help a lot, especially if, as I am, you are dealing with a group of players who, many of whom have various degrees of neurodivergence. Yeah, that's a, uh, a really good way to state that, though, just of like taking the mental load off of the person who's actually running the session. That is something I noticed when we did our one shot is that um, he was comfortable passing off stuff like, well, what do you think? What do you guys think would actually happen here? And, you know, trusting us to not just like ask for as much as we possibly could take, you know, in that moment. But let's talk about the. Um, neurodivergence a little bit you mentioned um that you had some experience uh dming for people um like that yes so i myself um autistic have asperger syndrome which terminology gets used depends on what generation of diagnostic criteria the mental health professional of the day wants to use but i also play in groups that there's a couple of other autistic people that I play with. There's a couple of people with ADHD. And uh, you have to consider different things, partly about how you're giving information and partly about the general play environment when you're dealing with a group like that. And um, some of it is stuff that's generally helpful. Me and my autism, I don't necessarily pick up on it's, it's this classic thing of autistic people having trouble with sarcasm and things that are implied but not stated outright. That's sure. something that's a big issue for me in communication. So I've sort of learned to uh, just tell people upright that, hey, just be as explicit with me as you possibly can because I will not pick up on things you are <laughs> implying. And that's often good, uh, both from a player and player side and GM side, if you're having problems in your session because it sets this expectation of, okay, I need you to communicate clearly and honestly with me about this problem, which doesn't necessarily come naturally to anyone <laughs> in my experience. Mm -hmm. So but I'm already used to having that conversation just because if I don't, I will not understand anything. <laughs> That's just a generally helpful thing. But there are other things that do get a bit more complicated. There's, uh, for instance, uh, me and one of the uh, players with ADHD in the group. I don't deal very well with bright light, uh, but uh, he doesn't deal very well with low light levels. It just sort of puts him to sleep. So trying to balance the way we just set up the room we're playing in, when we're playing in person at least, becomes this issue of like, okay, who can take more of the mental load today? And that's the kind of judgment that it's often it often ends up being the GM's responsibility 
just because they're considered the authority. But in a group like ours, where a lot of people have that experience, it becomes a bit more of a shared responsibility. I, I wouldn't have thought about how the just the actual physical environment could potentially affect someone like that. So that's, I mean, definitely more things to be aware of than well than I was aware of. So yeah, it's a it's a surprisingly a big uh, issue. It it can depend a lot on the person. You know, even within this small group of. TTRPG nerds. We've got people who have very different degrees of tolerance for different things. And, you know, we've got some people who have more of the motor issues versus someone like me for whom it's mostly a uh, brain does not function at certain times of day problem. Trying to balance all that is is very important for everyone's experience, really, because if you don't pay attention to, to that kind of thing, if you have the room so brightly lit that I get overloaded, if there's too much background noise happening, if people don't get enough time to rest, that will start to cut into people's ability to engage with the game. Mm -hmm. And once you start cutting into people's ability to engage, then that's when it starts cutting into everyone else's fun. After all, not everyone in the group does have these issues, but everyone is going to notice if the people who do are struggling because they're going to be less active in the role play, they're going to get cranky and overwhelmed, or just not have the energy to carry on. So it really becomes a case of, well, partly just taking care of our fellow TTRPG players and our friends, but also just making sure that the game is still enjoyable. Right, and it really comes just back to wanting everybody at the table to have a good experience and enjoy the game and whatever you know changes or physical settings or anything that you have to do to accommodate that that's really the most important piece yes and it's something that uh well we've really had to rethink a lot of things with the pandemic situation a couple of campaigns that we were playing in person have moved online as a result of that. One hasn't. And adjusting to that has led to its own set of problems. Uh, there's one campaign where not everyone is comfortable with uh, video calls. Uh, so we only do voice chat there. And I tend to have a lot of trouble with that because I have trouble processing auditory only information, for instance. So. We've had to make a different set of accommodations for that campaign compared to another where people are a bit more comfortable with video calls, where I can actually see what's going on. Sure. So even little changes, even little differences, I should say, like that, it was quite a big change going from in-person to online, can make a world of difference. So with the neurodivergence, does that change? So you talked a little bit about how that changes maybe your at the table environment, but does it change anything or do you have to accommodate anything as far as like story goes or like what systems you guys use? Well, in terms of system, the major difference that uh, we've noticed is that uh, we have certain players in the group for whom reading comprehension is more of a thing that can be variable due to their neurodivergence. And one thing that I know that uh, one of my uh, fellow players in particular has struggled with uh, was in the shift from 4e to 5e D&D, they changed the way uh, rule, rules text is written. And the difference between the two was enough that uh, this particular individual, he had more or less memorized the level progression from 4e and could rattle that off without a second thought, but he really struggles to just process the way 5e is written. Sure. So that's something that becomes more something that we have to share around the table in that situation, because we have people around the table who can handle 5e, but that person then ends up needing a bit more help at leveling up, just processing these text chunks. What the changes are, yeah. and. And that's another one that I wouldn't have thought of being an issue, but they do, with every game, um, the author does, you know, they approach it, the writing with a certain 
um, style. And I would agree that some, um, even just certain RPG books or just books in general, some are easier to read than others just based on if the author writes it in a style that kind of meshes with the way that your brain works uh, and some not so much. So I, I can see that just kind of being an extreme of that scenario where this the style of writing just did not mesh for him. Precisely. It, uh, it's less of an issue for me because it's something that I've spent a lot of time working on, which is part of why I am the resident rules gremlin. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's not something that we generally found that there are systems that don't work at all uh, because of the neurodivergencies within the group. But there are situations where maybe things that you would usually expect to be the individual player's responsibility becomes something that we have to do in a more collaborative way. Sure, you just end up sharing some of that load around. Yes. We're going to take a quick break from the episode, and I am going to read a submission for our contest. Hopefully this will spark some ideas for all of you that have not submitted yet. This is actually my submission, so here we go. Carved into the northern mountain wall of Kald Jinan is a small system of caves, home to a rare species of mushroom, the Halwasa. Only a single gatehouse entrance to the caves exists, and it is protected by a small complement of city guards. Moving past the small gatehouse, one finds themselves moving down an ever-narrowing set of stairs carved out of the cave itself. The first thing a visitor will notice is the humidity. The further down you go, the more damp and heavy the air becomes. As you descend the stairs, you also notice various troughs of water which are fed from a single large reservoir on the surface. The water, warmed from the sun and the reservoir, travels into the deepest parts of the caves, both heating the air and providing humidity required for the Halwasa to grow. The pipes are cut or drilled into at various points to allow water to drip onto the dark stone walls. The air is heavy, wet, and carries a musty, stale smell. The stairwell and walls are slippery to the touch. The constant flow of water through the troughs and the dripping of water onto the stone makes the cave seem as if it were under a perpetual rainstorm. At the bottom, the passage opens into multiple large rooms, a few housing the growing mushrooms at various stages. The halwasa is a small, bulbous white mushroom. The cap of the mushroom produces an enzyme that emits blue light, eliminating the need for other light sources. The processing room sits adjacent to the growing rooms, littered with workbenches, containers, tools, and wooden crates of harvested halwasa mushrooms. Mesu, a farmer, sits at a workbench grinding dried halwasa into a fine powder with mortar and pestle. Mesu's white robes include a small section that covers his nose and mouth to protect himself from the hallucinogenic powder. He fills glass jars with the powder and sets them into a wooden crate. While the halwasa is considered a culinary delicacy for the elite, the powder is even more coveted. The powder is used with incense in temples for religious ceremonies. Some warriors even use it to create poison that, while not fatal, will incapacitate a target for hours. In the center of the room is a small square platform made of wood, measuring two feet on either side. A series of ropes, pulleys, and winches allow the platform to be raised from the processing room to the gatehouse hundreds of feet above. This elevator is the easiest way to transfer harvested and processed halwasa to the surface. Mesu loads a final crate of jars onto the lift platform. He starts rotating the wooden winch, and the platform starts to slowly ascend. And with your your writing, um, do you, is most of your writing focused on um, like one shots and RPG stuff, or do you do writing outside of the role playing world? Um, yes, uh, what I tend to refer to as the start of my hobbyist writing career was really the first time I finished something that was novel length, so to speak. Uh, so. Outside the context of writing for RPGs, I do still do a lot of novel writing stuff. And uh, I've been told that shows in the way I approach TTRPGs at times. <laughs> I care a lot about uh, mechanical and narrative details meshing in 
a satisfying way, uh, somewhat to the irritation of <laughs> uh, other rules lawyers. <laughs> but uh, yes, so it is. Uh, there are a lot of sim similar skills to apply, but it is still a very different experience writing for novels versus writing for TTRPGs, especially in terms of what you have to care about, so to speak. So world building in particular is where I really notice a difference. When I'm writing for some personal novel project of mine, I really only have to world build the things that I believe are going to be relevant to the story. And what I think is relevant is going to be a pretty good idea of where the story is going to go, because I'm the only person involved in its creation. If I'm writing a setting that I'm going to throw players into, or if I'm writing up a backstory for a character to give to someone else who's GMing a game, then I have to fill in a lot more because I don't know to the same extent what kind of story they're interested in telling. So uh, speaking of sharing the mental load around, um, I more or less built an entire culture for one of the other GM's campaigns because I made a character from that campaign and he hadn't prepared much detail about them. So he just told me to do some world building and I took that and I ran with it. <laughs> so that's pretty cool that he just kind of gave that piece to you. Um, I know there are certain games like, or some, a lot of the P, uh, the power by the ugh, powered by the apocalypse games say, you know, offload some of that information onto your players and then there are other extremes that i've i've played in games where like the the dm was like the author of the setting and like all questions had to go through them to make sure that it like made sense within their world um so it's i i, I for me as a as a dungeon master i I like to give some of that responsibility and just get it off my plate uh, and let the players come up with stuff, but not everybody likes that. So it's fun when you see that people get to contribute in that way. Yes, it's it's definitely something that I understand both sides of. It's obviously a huge boon for me to be able to go off and do a lot of my own world building, especially since I think it allowed me to create probably one of the best written characters that I've ever brought into a campaign. But at the same time, I know what I'm like as a DM, and I definitely fall more on the I want to have a bit more control over the world I'm running side. It really becomes this thing of what type of fun are you looking for in any particular game? And does the group you have put together work with that? And that's something that I think is quite interesting, actually, about being in this position where I'm playing with so many different GMs, more or less concurrently, I get to experience a lot of different GMing styles and different approaches to world building. And uh, the variety in and of itself is uh, something that I quite appreciate. It's nice to be able to go from playing one campaign that's very serious and quite intense about combat, and then a few days later be in a different campaign where things are a bit lighter, a bit less serious combat is a bit less intense. Having that variety is something that probably can just be instructive for anyone who wants to learn how to DM because you get to see different ways of doing the same job. But it's also just good for your experience of TTRPGs, I feel. Because TTRPGs, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons in particular, I think because it's the one that's well known, people pick up an idea of how it's played. And if they don't experience a few more varieties of it, that might well be the only way they think it can ever be played. But TTRPGs don't tend to play out the same way, <laughs> even in the same system. So seeing that variety, I think, is it's just very good for both your understanding of the game and your idea of what TTRPGs can be. Yeah, and I think the variety can help with almost burnout or or boredom. Um, and, and maybe this is just me as a DM, but when I 
Like, if you play in a game that's really serious for a while, then you kind of want to play something that's just a little bit more relaxed. And if you play something that's too relaxed for a while, then you kind of want to play it the opposite. Or if it's, you know, a bunch of high magic and a bunch of crazy stuff, then you kind of want to play low magic. And then it kind of flips as you, you know, as you play in something, you kind of get bored of it a little bit or, or just tired of it. So having that variety can let you just kind of have a fresh mentality. Yes, absolutely. It's something that uh, I've noticed myself bouncing between different games and also between working on one shots in different systems. I'll play a game in one campaign or I'll write a bit for a D&D one shot and then I'll think, oh, but wait, I have this really good idea for something to do in a Coriolis one shot or something I'm really f looking forward to in the other campaign. And not having to wait an agonizingly long time for the opportunity to have that other session or work on that other one shot is it's quite nice yeah that and that's kind of like i have two main groups that we really don't even play that frequently but um one that's more sci-fi star wars type games and one that's more like D, D fantasy type games and it, exactly what you said You'll be doing one and have an idea for another one and be like, ah, oh, but but if we don't play for a while, then you're not going to get to do that thing. But then you kind of flip-flop them back and forth. Yes, the, the obvious downside of doing things the way that my playgroup does is that we are all playing a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, often on a very tight schedule. And for the time being, it's working because pandemic we have nothing else to do but those schedules are we've had some scheduling issues come up because one of the people who's currently running a campaign recently started working full-time and that meant that we had to rethink how we were scheduling that and that's probably only going to get worse once people start getting vaccinated uh they're not uh, quite down to people in their 20s in uh our area of sweden yet so <laughs> We're not quite out of the woods. Sure. Yeah, it's been nice here in the States, at least where I'm at. We've pretty much everybody, I think even under like 15, is vaccinated now. Or at least there's availability to get vaccinated. So um, it most things are pretty back to normal for us, But which makes things a little bit easier here. But yeah, if there are other other places that aren't quite back up and running yet. Are there any specific tools or websites or anything that you, or books even, that you like to use either as inspiration or to help you with planning or writing sessions? So most of my planning tends to just get, get done straight into a Google Doc page. Uh, I, uh, I'll usually just more, more or less from beginning to end, it's all a single page in Google Docs, at least for one shots. Uh, I have run a short sort of campaign and that's got a lot more complicated very quickly. But uh, mostly when I'm running a session, I'm bouncing between Google Docs for pre-planned notes and stat blocks and then taking mid-session notes in a notebook. Um, I can't help but feel like it would be more efficient to have some kind of digital tool for that. But uh, in general, I've just found that I work a lot better being able to take physical notes, especially for things like initiative tracking and combat, just pen and paper works best for me. Sure. Um, I have, oh, goodness. I borrowed a couple of books off uh, some other people in the playgroup that had a lot of good exercises for developing characters and also working on GMing skills, but I cannot for the life of me remember what the names were. Oh. There's sound, always something. They sound like good books. <laughs> uh, yes, they were very helpful. There was a series of... I know there was one about being a better GM and one about uh, developing player characters, and... Hmm. I could probably ask those friends what books those were and uh, possibly get names for you, but uh, my goodness, I cannot remember them at this moment. Yeah, if you, <laughs> uh, me. 
maybe after the show or when or it's early there so whenever whenever you get a chance if you did want to do that then i can try and throw links to them at least um for the listeners that'd be cool yep they they were very good books uh this is uh (laughs) this is one of those problems that comes with uh a bunch of GMs sort of sharing responsibility for a group. Someone has all of the books you could ever possibly want uh, for running any kind of campaign. Uh, but it's one person in a rather sprawling group that has those books. <laughs> so, <laughs> so finding them when you need them can be a bit of an adventure. <laughs> um, is there anything that you um, particularly struggle with as a uh, game master? Hmm. I mean, the thing that I always feel stressed about in the moment uh, tends to be running combat, actually. Uh, partly just because, having come from playing quite a lot of 5e, combat can drag very easily, and it's not necessarily the part of TTRPGs that I enjoy either playing or running, to be honest. I. Uh, I tend to uh, get a little overly stressed when it comes to combat. So I I worry that I'm not getting the balance between keeping the pace up and uh, keeping the narrative detailed enough. So if you don't describe it enough, people lose track of what's happening and you have to go back over things. But if you get too bogged down, it takes forever. And combat is already often a slow uh, part of a session in any case. It's a part that worries me out of proportion to the extent that my players have actually complained about it. Oh, but it's no. always that thing that just... <laughs> I mean, in general, my players have been very nice to me about uh, my GMing. And uh, I mean, th- there's definitely issues because, I mean, that's doing things for you. You're not going to get everything right. That's just not how anything works. Uh, but uh, combat is the part that I tend to worry about most um it also doesn't help that we do have one very good voice actor uh in the group and i always feel like my npc voices just don't cut it when he's playing but uh (laughs) Uh, yeah i'm not super great at doing voices i at least i haven't been uh my my trouble probably is more just being comfortable doing it um I did play in a campaign, a D&D campaign that was run by um, a couple of friends from high school that were both in, uh, or actually multiple of them were in theater, but the the main two that were kind of co-GMing were, were in theater, so their voices were just spot on, and I was like, man, I don't know if I could ever <laughs> live up to that. Yes. But well, that's the that's the secret, really, that you sort of have to learn as a GM is that you don't have to live up to it. <laughs> I mean, I, I've watched Critical Role. I've watched uh, Matt Mercer do voices. I completely forgot his name for a moment there. And it's all very impressive and all, but you don't need to be Matt Mercer in order to make a game that your players enjoy. Yeah, I mean, my voices might not be up to the standard of the voice actor in the group, but... Generally speaking, I haven't had much trouble with my players forgetting which NPC they're talking to or getting NPCs confused, which tells me that I'm keeping them distinct enough for practical purposes. And really, considering the fact that I've never really been that into theater or and I've never been that good at different voices prior to starting to play TTRPGs, it's a pretty good showing, I think. Yeah, that's good that they're able to tell your uh, NPCs apart. The one thing that always makes me nervous is if I have to have two NPCs talk to each other. Um, I try to avoid that situation happening as much as possible. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely something I also avoid. Partly just because if, you, if you're running a one-shot in particular and you're on a timer... Any time that you're using for stuff that isn't the players doing things... <laughs> It, it it's really not something you want to be doing more than you absolutely have to in that situation. You want the players to be going off and doing their thing as much as possible. And that's something that I've generally found with most of the other GMs in the group as well, is that they don't generally have several NPCs in the same scene 
partly because talking to themselves is kind of awkward and partly just because at that point you're also slightly taken away from the player characters. There are situations in which it can't reasonably be avoided. But uh, a lot of those, a lot of scenes where there are several NPCs are also things that the other GMs of the group will sort of montage or just give mm, a summary of sure. rather than role playing out. The benefit uh, of having multiple DMs uh, playing. <laughs> yes, there there have also been incidents where other people have been asked to run NPCs for certain scenes, uh, especially if their player character isn't there just to give the GM a bit more to work with. Yeah, and that, that can be a lot of work. Um, I was going to say, like like you said, it's almost a waste of time or you're, you're maybe wasting precious moments um, if you're just talking to yourself as an NPC. And it's a lot of work to, to have a conversation that nobody else is involved in at the same time. So, Yeah, and you're already balancing so much in your head as a GM. So, I mean, it's something that I've noticed after I finish running a session, even a one shot, which, you know, is over at a certain point, And then I don't really have to plan anything after that. I have to take a couple of hours after any session I run to just sit down and try and figure out what happened because my brain is firing while I'm running the game at such a pace that I just don't have time to remember any of it. It, there's just so much going on there's so much involved with just running a game yeah i agree it's it can be almost easier to just look back on it or think back on it and be like okay what happened where did they go okay this is at least in terms of like a longer term campaign you can't do a lot of that thinking in the moment because you're you're overloaded so you got to deal with it after the fact yeah absolutely and again, with the various campaigns being run by different GMs, we've all generally found that it's easier if one of the players just has reasonably decent notes, just because one of the players keeping notes is often more reliable than the GM trying to remember what it was that we did 10 sessions ago in that other place, the one other time we met that one NPC. Yeah, that is a very good point because the first couple of games that I, I and actually I don't know if I've ever really taken notes during a session of what happens. Um, there's just too much going on for me to also have time to jot notes down that aren't like immediately relevant. Yeah, I definitely can't do note taking while in the middle of running a game either. I did try uh, the first couple of sessions I ran. I stopped doing that quite quickly. <laughs> Um, when you're doing one shots, are the players using characters that they have already made, or are these like completely new characters that just show up for the one shots? Uh, there have been a couple of characters that come back for various one shots, but usually it's fresh characters each time. Partly because playing with a bunch of GMs, everyone has a million character concepts that they've <laughs> never gotten to play. <laughs> And they all just have lists of things they want to try out at some point. Um, with with the Coriolis one shots, I do always offer to have pre-made characters for everyone, mostly because the character creation process in Coriolis is very much designed to be a collaborative thing. The basic fiction of the setting being that the player characters are the crew of a ship. So there are certain parts of character creation where it really matters to know what job everyone has on the ship because there are certain situations where having all of the different roles covered really matters mechanically and there's also a system in Coriolis for group talents I have no idea what they're called in the English rule book but uh, anyway that's more or less what they are which are special abilities that the group shares and that sort of thing isn't really well suited to the kind of character creation that you might be doing for a one shot Whereas in 5e, for instance, you can pretty much just roll up a character on your own and bring it to a table not knowing what anyone else is doing, and your character is still going to function the exact same. You might just have party balance issues. So Coriolis, I always offer to have pre-made characters just to save everyone the trouble of trying to do this rather involved character creation process for a one-shot. 
but uh, most of my players tend to want to make their own characters anyway. So, <laughs> do they end up meeting, I tried to like ahead of time to work on some of the kind of shared pieces? Uh, we do try to uh, do that. Yes. Uh, sometimes it doesn't end up being a meeting, but people just communicate a bit over chat beforehand. Uh, most of this group is pretty used to playing with each other, so usually that's fine. But I do also generally try to keep my Coriolis one-shots a little shorter and tighter in terms of planning as well, just to account for the fact that we're going to need a bit of extra time just to make sure that everyone's character is mesh okay. Um, and then, so like before... Bef so like before they would make the characters do you kind of give them an idea of what the session might be about so that they can um make characters that kind of fit that theme or is it kind of just on the fly i will usually give them uh, a sort of ballpark idea although at this point most of them have learned to guess that i will probably make them solve a mystery <laughs> uh, but yes i i do try to give them a little steer uh, it's not something that's ever become an issue that I can recall, uh, but I do also have a very willing group of players. That's one of the advantages of playing with GMs, is that they are very good at adjusting characters to situations. They're, I don't really have the issue with this group of people making characters who just end up being sticks in the mud, so to speak. People are very adaptable about their concepts, and they're all very prepared to bend their characters to make sure that the game works, which is... It, it almost sounds like a bad thing when you phrase it that way, but it's something that can become... Like, there's this classic idea of the player who sort of derails a game and is a nuisance to everyone else and justifies it by saying, it's what my character would do. That's not a thing that I've generally found happens with characters played by other GMs. Yeah, I think that, so kind of like what we mentioned earlier with them kind of having seen behind the curtain and they, they know the amount of work that goes into set it just even setting up a game and running a game. I feel like playing with a group of dungeon masters makes everybody a little bit more forgiving and wanting to make sure that the story and everything moves forward or they're more willing like you said to kind of bend and just to to make sure that the experience can be a little bit smoother than you maybe would have otherwise if you had just players who just want to have something a very specific way yeah especially for the one shots where it is more of a these are throwaway characters and we are here to go for a particular plot point the stick in the mud thing you do get a little closer to it in the campaigns, even with characters played by GMs. But at that point, it usually becomes more of a, this is about the development of this character, or we're using this to explore some kind of conflict in between various characters. And it, it tends to be motivated in a different way. The one shots, that kind of thing isn't so important. So everyone is very forgiving in terms of their character concepts there, usually. Yeah, well, and when you're on such a short timeline, too, and, and you mentioned a little bit of railroading, too, like, that's just kind of something that you assume with the nature of a one-shot, just because it is so condensed. Yeah, you don't have time to do a lot of character development in a one-shot, and if you're trying to do character development in a one-shot, then uh, you're mostly going to make it difficult. And uh, luckily, my playgroup understands that. So, yeah, I could be working with a much more difficult group of players, all things <laughs> considered. <laughs> well, it's good that you have, it sounds like a, a very good group, you know, that can alternate who's running in the, the game and everything. I mean, it sounds like a great group to play with. Yeah, it's been... It's been a really good introduction to the game, and part of the reason I felt confident moving into GMing myself so soon after starting to play was that I had such good examples from the other people in the group. I had a really good sense of how the culture of the group worked, how how people adjusted to each other. I mean, I've spent enough time on the internet to 
see various horror stories of terrible <laughs> deep sessions go around. And it's just so far removed from what I've experienced with this group. And that's something that's been very fortunate, especially for someone like me who, I mean, that's again with the neurodivergence, you do end up in situations occasionally where the degree to which people in that group are able to accommodate and change things can really make or break your experience with a hobby. And I really ended up in a group that worked really well for letting people like me get into this hobby that could have been really difficult had the social context just been slightly different. So right. yep. I've been really lucky in that respect. Um, you mentioned that you had, uh, it sounded like most of your games to begin with were in person, correct? Yes. Um, and, and they maybe moved on, some of them have moved online. Um, and I guess I don't, it doesn't necessarily matter with the question I'm going to ask, but do you find yourself or your group using, um, like miniatures or tokens and maps and stuff, or do you lean more like theater of the mind just kind of explaining everything it is mostly theater of the mind unless it's a larger combat situation uh, the exact extent to which we use maps depends a bit on the dm who's running a particular game uh, i very rarely use maps myself uh, partly because i'm lazy and i don't want to draw them <laughs> but also partly just because i'm running a one shot here it's really a lot of effort to go to prepping something that I'm going to use maybe once and then just discard completely. But some of the other people in the group do prefer to have maps for most combats, if not necessarily all. Yeah, definitely in combat they can help just because sometimes the like, well, how close am I standing to this person? Where, you know, how far away, what angle that can all get somewhat lost in the theater of the mind um or just forgotten as to where exactly everybody's at so sometimes um having the maps just makes it visually apparent where everything is happening um but it, sometimes things that are very uh like you said large scale use maps but like if you're just in like a hallway or something then sometimes even at combat doesn't necessarily matter a whole lot because there's just not a lot of spatial awareness that you necessarily need yeah it very much depends on i mean a combat where it's more or less we are in a room fighting one or two enemies probably not going to use a map for that but well partly if it's a big story moment i know one gm will often get the maps out when he feels that it's narratively appropriate to <laughs> rather than basing it on how complex the actual combat is, which is very endearing. <laughs> but a lot of the time, it's really just about how much are you balancing in terms of terrain and other characters involved. And there's one of the campaigns which is currently in ongoing where it really helps to have a map out because we have a druid who has a tendency to summon a lot of animals. Uh, yes. And uh, you lose track of, I mean, he summoned 16 wolves in the combat a while back, and it's just, you can try to keep that in your head if you really want to, but uh, I don't. Yeah, that's, you got enough going on already. <laughs> yes. I had a lot of fun talking to you. Um, I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Yeah, it, it's been great fun talking to you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Dungeon Master's Toolkit Podcast. You can find links to all of the products and resources that we talked about on the show in the show notes. And if you'd like to join the community or find out how to be on the show, check out our subreddit or join us in our Discord server. 